Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode 761. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, and we've got a great crew with us today. And after I introduce the crew, you'll kind of get a sense of what we're up to if you haven't seen the title of this episode yet already. We have with us Carlton Wynn, who is a pastor, associate pastor at Westminster PCA in Atlanta, Georgia. He also serves as an adjunct professor uh, teaching theology at RTS Atlanta. Welcome back, Carlton. So good to see you again. It is so good to be back for another Van Til group. Yes, sir. We're talking Van Til, and that means we also have with us uh, Dr. Lane Tipton, who serves as the pastor of Trinity OPC up in Easton, Pennsylvania, as well as serving as a fellow of biblical and systematic theology here at Reformed Forum. Lane, so good to see you. Big day. It's great to have you with us. Oh, yeah. Van Til Group is an unqualified delight. <laughs> so happy to be here. Yes, you know that uh, we try every every month and a half or every two months to do a Van Til Group where we're walking through Van Til's book, in Defense of the Faith, The Defense of the Faith. We have a first edition copy here that we're all working with different uh, individual copies ourselves or four editions out there. But uh, we've got the first we're working through. Um We haven't been uh, as timely with these episodes as we would like. I was kind of appalled to see the last one we did was in April, uh, Mm. and it's July 2022 as we record, but uh, we'll get through it. The book's not going anywhere, and if the Lord comes back before we finish, then we'll be in a better position anyway, so (laughs) we can't lose. All epistemological (laughs) self-consciousness will come. It sure will. We'll make it. Uh, But until that day, we'll continue to strive and learn to understand our Lord and his word better. Today, we're going to be talking about epistemology and ontology, the self-determinative character of God. Uh, anti-correlativism. But before we get into that, and before Carlton leads us kind of on a recap, catching up where we've been um, at the end of chapter two, now today turning into chapter three, we've got massive news, just massive news from just from a reform forum standpoint, but at least for Lane and me, uh, it's just personal news because today I have in my hands a copy of Lane's book, The Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til. They finally arrived yesterday. This book has been in the works for ages. Lane, you started it. Did you graduate in 03 or, or 2004 formally with the, uh, the PhD from Westminster? I think I started teaching in 03, but graduated officially in 04. So this, the, right. That's what I, I was guessing. So this book started as a dissertation, but this book, Lane will be the first to tell you is uh, not the same. Uh, it doesn't mean that anything was is substantially different, that any cases were changed or anything, or that Lane flipped on his views from the earlier, but it's it's uh, it's been sharpened, it's been tightened, it's been expanded, uh, and we have truly just a beautiful book. I'm confident that people will be reading this one way or another for decades. It's, it's significant. It is a significant piece of scholarship, and I couldn't be happier on how this turned out. Not only the text... But the actual printing of this book, um, it's awesome. I, I, yeah, it's. I don't want to toot our own horn, but I guess I'm gonna. But it, yeah, I'll it's toot beautiful. it. Camden, you did a phenomenal <laughs> job organizing that cover. It's fantastic. Yes, it is beautiful. absolutely beautiful. Thank so you. I will gladly tout it. I mean, wonderful. Um, what do you call that? Symbol kind of uh, sure. seal. We're very thankful there. to David David Facet who did a tremendous work on designing the cover as well as this, uh, uh, creating us a custom seal that is integrated yeah. into uh, the dust jacket of the book. And big thanks to Rob McKenzie for organizing all of this work with David, their friends. And um, it wouldn't have been come about the way it did without both of their help. It's tremendous. But let me for those watching the video, I'm going to take the dust jacket off here. And so we've got, um, you know, it's a cloth cover. We've got the uh, the uh, print, the foil printing on the side with the title and then Lane's name and then the Reform Forum Lion logo. But on the front is foil printed the custom seal, the CVT seal with a cross on it. And then it says Suaviter in Modo, Fortiter in Re, which is kind of a, a slogan that Van Til would use in Latin, which is basically a smooth in the mode and strong in the thing. So it's seeking to be winsome and um, loving in our apologetic, not just beating people over the head, 
but also being uncompromising and strong in our principles and in our commitment to Christ and to his word in the way that we defend. There's a way to be smooth in, in mode and weak in the thing, you know, just being wishy-washy and, try, and tickling people's ears. There's also a way to be strong in the thing and just smash people <laughs> in an unloving way. But what Van Til sought to do is to do apologetic suaviter and moto fortiter and race. We've emblazoned that into a seal and we've got that stamped onto the cover of the book as well as integrated into the design of the cover itself. So it's it's awesome. Wonderful. Camden, let me just say, you did a fantastic job tracing that seal from the tattoo that's on uh, Lane's back. <laughs> just well done. <laughs> Please tell me it's a, he's got a, like his own theological <laughs> tramp stamp on the back. <laughs> I didn't say where it was on his back. I just said it was on. I'm his sorry. Back. I'm sorry to that I disclosed that, but you know, that was private. But you know, <laughs> for listeners out there, I'm I'm completely kidding. Hey, well, the you inter- can cut that the, out if the you inter- want to. No, we're leaving that. Let me, let me um before we get into the to the discussion today, I've got some other big news relative to this book because you may be wondering how to get it. Uh, So we are going to be having copies for sale on the website. I think our formal release date is August 2nd, maybe the 3rd. I think there's a Tuesday in there. I can't recall off the top of my head, but that's coming up soon relative to when this episode will release. So we should have all of these things lined up and ready to go in the store. In terms of right now, the time I'm living in, uh, they're they're in the works and we're almost done with them. But by the time this podcast comes out, all this stuff should be ready to go. So we are going to be offering, you know, individual copies of this for sale soon enough. They will be in the store, reformedforum.org slash store. Uh, we might have a sale price going on. Uh, the retail price is $34.99. This is a serious piece of scholarship. It's um, hardcover with jacket, 181 pages. And um, it's very much in the format and the feel of one of the, you know, Oxford University Press books. It's that kind of feel to it, but also the substance. Uh, And you're not going to find anything on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology like this at all. No one addresses this anywhere ever. And so this is this is a to me an instant classic. But um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of people reading it, and uh, hopefully have a lot of scholarly interaction on it. But in addition to the individual copies, we're going to be offering 100 kits a deluxe package let me see my notes here we've got all sorts of cool stuff let me tell you what we have um this exclusive deal a a limited edition deal you'll not only get the book with the hardcover and dust jacket uh, you'll also get um we will emboss the front page we have a we bought an embosser with that seal you know sometimes people have the uh the thing they'll stamp their books and says, you know, ex libris, and then the guy's initials or something like that. You ever seen anybody do that before, guys? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we've got one of those, and we we had one custom made with the seal that's part of the cover and stamped on the front. So for the people that are buying the deluxe kit, we'll emboss the front page of that. We'll also include an electronic copy of the book uh, in PDF and EPUB formats like we did with the Voss book. We'll also include this crazy challenge coin. So we had the Machen challenge coin made for the first Reform Forum conference. I think it was in 2014. We've now made some Van Til challenge coins, which have the Van Til seal on the back, the tail side, and on the head side, a picture of Van Til based on a a sketch uh, by Rodrigo, a Brazilian artist. Um, We'll get you his info if you're interested. And on the front, it says Reformed Forum. And then it has Greek uh, from 2 Corinthians 10, 5, uh, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And um, on the back, of course, the uh, suaviter and moto fortiter and race seal. <clears throat> and then finally, the last thing we have is this limited edition print. We have a photograph of Van Til sitting in a chair reading Time magazine. <laughs> And then I've uh, painstakingly retouched this as best I could. And then we also have it uh, printed on this uh, beautiful metallic paper. It's a metallic print. So when you're looking at it in the light, it's hard to capture that on the on the camera. But when you're looking at it in the light, it's very silvery and uh, almost kind of like three-dimensional, the way the, the way the images pop off the screen. So it's exciting to have all of these things together. And uh, we're delighted to be able to package those and have those available on the website together in a deluxe kit, a limited edition. We're only going to have 100 of them. 
So if you want to get all of those things together, we'll have that for sale on the website. I think for 75, I think is the price. So the book itself is retailing at 34.99. So you get the challenge coin, the print, the electronic copy, all of the, uh, the embossed page, all that kind of stuff together. Plus you'll be helping us out a great deal. So if that's something that interests you, uh, head on over to reformedforum.org slash store to get your print today. So guys, any final thoughts on that before we jump on into the defense of the faith? Lane, this has been such a long time coming. I'm sure it's, you don't even have a copy in your hands yet. We, we're mailing yours yeah. out. We must feel, um, I don't know how it would feel. I remember when my dissertation was finally in print. It's it's almost surreal. And I hope you have that same feeling when the book shows up yeah. in the mail. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just so thankful for the whole process and for the opportunity the past uh, couple of years to give extensive time and sustained attention to revising it and bringing it to a point where I think it was uh, time to publish. And then just thanks so much for the stellar job uh, that you've done and that Reform Forum's done uh, in in terms of its publication and the quality of the cover and the, the, the jacket. It's, it's just beautiful. So... Well, to quote yeah. someone whose the election was stolen from her, it takes a village. It takes a village. <laughs> but no, we're th- we couldn't be happier and, and thankful to you uh, for your work too. So, um, you know, Thanks, brother. just bottom line, the fact I just was just beside myself yesterday, just saying this book exists and I'm holding it. And so I just great. rejoice in that. The fact that this book exists, that a book on Van Til's Trinitarian theology that doesn't caricature him, but that deals critically with him his polemical context, integrating it into current issues, whether people agree or not. And I hope you win over many of the detractors. I think you will win over many of them. But whether or not you you do, this, this forces the issue to have substantial conversation on this. As much as all the Thomists want substantial conversation on Thomas, I do too. We want to get down deep into the system. It's like, well, we, we also need to have some serious conversations about Van Til's actual theology. And uh, this book, I hope, will force or press the issue, especially as it gets into several people's hands. We'll have to talk about primary sources and what people actually said and wrote and thought. And that's a good thing. Yeah, Camden, the only couple of things I would add is one, the only thing that surpasses the aesthetics of the book itself is the content of Mm -hmm. the book. Absolutely. And number two, um, what, what Lane does in this book is not only um, unpack Van Til's Trinitarian theology, but shows how he's building on the likes of Calvin and Voss and Bavink. Princeton and mm-hmm. Bavink. And he so he's showing the integration of Van Til's theology of the Trinity with the luminaries that we all know and love. And mm-hmm. so it's just a, a wonderful tour de force in, in a Tiptonian mode, as I like to say, uh, that's going to be very useful, I think, for people who, who take the time to study it and, and read it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Praise the Lord for that. Well, let's jump on into chapter three here. But as we get started and revved up into chapter three of the defense of the faith, um, we're looking at page 48. Uh why don't you get us up to speed, Carlton? Let us know maybe what we talked about last time and how uh, this bleeds into or, or blends into this chapter, which is titled The Christian Philosophy of Knowledge. Thanks, Camden. I, I can't believe it's been since April since we've gotten together to, to do this. I think we had high hopes that we were going to do it on a semi-regular basis, but maybe maybe in weeks to come. Uh, I can go aspire. back on YouTube to see what we had covered last time, but <laughs> but but thankfully uh, Van Til recaps it, uh, so it's good to recap with Van Til where we've been. He has addressed in chapter one what we are to believe and defend. Remember, this is a book seeking to set forth a reformed apologetic, uh, but in order to do that, we need to know what the reformed faith is, and so he he embarks on that, and 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 he's doing so to set forth clearly and crisply over against his critics what exactly he believes and then how that dovetails with a reformed apologetic. And he, and he concludes uh, way back on page 23 that, that what we are to believe and defend is, quote unquote, Christian theism as a unit. And in order to explain what that means, he walks through the main doctrines of the reformed faith, doctrine of God, his attributes, 
personality, triunity, doctrine of man, uh, his, his status as the image of God, his responsibility toward all of creation, and the impact of the fall upon man, male and female. He, he heads into the doctrine of Christ, his nature and offices, doctrine of salvation, uh, God's sovereignty in it and sovereign application of it to us, the doctrine of the church, paying particular attention to the invisible dimension of the church as the elect given from the father to the son, uh, redeemed in time. And then the doctrine of the last things, God's sovereign purpose to consummate his plan of redemption and his plan for the world under Christ. And through it all, he's maintained this dogged commitment never to mix the eternal and the temporal at any point. And we've seen that emerge as a consistent theme in Van Til's writings. He doesn't want to mix or conflate the eternal being and knowledge of God with anything temporal at any point from creation to the incarnation to salvation. God is the sovereign and absolute Lord. He is the self-determined God, as we're going to talk about today. And he says, this is nothing but the Reformed faith and it alone. This is what we're seeking to believe and defend, particularly over against Roman Catholic theology and the deeper Catholic conception running from Thomas uh, to Bellarmine, um, uh, through Trent to Bellarmine, and lesser forms of evangelical Protestantism, and he has primarily in view Arminianism. Okay, that's what we are to believe and defend. And then in chapter two, remember, he's moved into a Christian philosophy of reality. And he says at the beginning of chapter two, we need to make contact with the philosophers and thinkers of the day, particularly Van Til's own day. And, and yet, as we seek to speak in the language of the philosophers, we need to be resolute in setting apart the Christian con conception of reality apart from every conception in the history of philosophy. And so Van Til is, is expounding uh, the Trinity, uh, the eternal unity and diversity of God uh, as one God subsisting as three mutually related and distinct persons and his sovereign purpose and activity of creating all that is not God, determining the, the temporal unity and diversity of the world and all of its history as an analogical reflection of his own triune glory. And dovetailing with that now, he begins chapter three, and the title is A Christian Philosophy of Knowledge. Again, though he's using the word philosophy, he means a Christian conception of knowledge, uh, a Christian and biblical understanding of human knowledge. And he begins this chapter with what I call worldview speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. He identifies three main sections of a Christian worldview, which you'll recognize are the main three branches of standard study of philosophy. Um, he describes a Christian, the he mentions a Christian theory of being or metaphysics, a Christian theory of knowledge, and a Christian theory of ethics or behavior. But then he does something fascinating. In addition to appending the word Christian to all of these things, he situates them in terms of the religious conception of man and of the reality of man's calling and identity as a worshiping creature, intimately related to God from the outset of his existence. Let me read from page 48. He says, basic to all the differences between the Christian and the non-Christian views of life is the fact that Christians worship and serve the creator while non-Christians worship and serve the creature. So I just want to pause for a moment and say, Van Til's not thinking of the main dimensions of a Christian worldview, reality, knowledge, and ethics, apart from an understanding that we are called to rejoice in, uh, serve, and reflect, and worship the God of glory. So why don't we pause for a second here, and Lane, what do you see as the significance of Van Til drawing out the dimension of worship at the outset of this discussion of, of a Christian philosophy or theory of knowledge? Uh, great question, Carlton. It, it's, it's a sentence that if you're not engaged, you just read right past and you say, oh, yeah, OK, that's just a preliminary statement. Let's move on to the substance. That's actually one of the most profound statements in this entire chapter, and here's why. Uh, 
Danny Olinger has told me, um, I haven't done the research myself, but uh, I trust Danny as a premier Voss scholar, um, uh, that, that Van Til was very familiar with Voss's reform dogmatics, was taking classes from Voss uh, himself, uh, often one or two students per class, time only with Voss. And what Van Til's doing here is he's situating the, the quote-unquote philosophy of knowledge under the rubric of reformed religion. In the um, reformed dogmatics, Foss speaks of the deeper Protestant conception of religion over against the deeper Roman Catholic conception of religion. And without going into detail, the point is that for the deeper Protestant conception, what Van Til's advocating, all image-bearing creatures are by nature religious. They worship and serve the creature pre-fall. They worship and serve the, uh, the creator. They worship and serve the creator pre-fall. They worship and serve the, the creature post-fall. And it's critical to remember that Voss and Van Til understand Rome to say that Adam was not naturally religious he didn't have natural religious fellowship with God apart from a supernaturally infused supplement, the donum super additum. And so the short point, uh, the short way to make the point is that Van Til is indirectly in terminology, but directly in substance invoking the religion of the deeper Protestant conception it's a place where Rome cannot begin, Arminian theology cannot begin, Socinians cannot begin, but Ventil situates the question of a Christian theory of knowledge in an inalienable religious relation to God that expresses itself in worship before the fall, worship of God, worship of the creature after the fall, and so there is no alien philosophical intrusion here. This is really just an organic development of the doctrine of the creator-creature relation he's developed earlier, now set under the rubric of worship. And so it's quite profound and invoking, I think, the underlying substance, A, of Voss's deeper Protestant conception of religion, and B, indirectly, it's already critiquing the Roman Catholic alternative. The, what Voss calls an externalist principle of religion. So it's profound, quite quite useful. Yeah, th that's very helpful. I, I one way to put it, okay, if polemically he's he's saying, look, as we study the 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 Christian understanding, the Bible's understanding of reality and knowledge and ethics, we're not only setting that over against a, a Roman Catholic conception or an Arminian conception, but I think for Christians, it's helpful to remember. Um, that, that when we're plowing through this book, when we're thinking about these things, this is a dimension of sanctification where we are learning to worship, as he writes on this page, we're learning to worship the creator more than the creature more and more. We're, we're, we're seeking to be consistent, religious, redeemed image of God by the work of the Holy Spirit working by and with the word in our hearts. And I think that that sets the trajectory for uh, our future discussion well. Um, okay, well, beyond that point, um, he goes on to say on page 49, just as it is important to have a Christian theory, uh, it is just as important to have a Christian theory of knowledge as it is to have a Christian theory of being. One cannot well have the one without at the same time also having the other. And this is probably going to take some time to unpack and develop the implications of, but what Van Til's asserting here is that a Christian theory of being with the triune God as our metaphysically primitive starting point, uh, a robust conception of the creator-creature distinction where there is a genuine relationship between God and the world in which God never changes in his relationship with the world that is perfectly under his sovereign control, with that, dovetailing from that, is a Christian conception of knowledge, and you don't lose the former when you move into the latter, but maintain it at every point. Um, they imply one another. They are inseparable from one another. Um, okay, 
I will confess to you guys that as I was reading this afresh, um, I, I've returned over the years to this question of, of which one comes first, a Christian theory of reality or a Christian theory of knowledge. And I've thought for, 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 for a little while, okay, the Christian theory of reality comes first because it's most basic. Uh, and as he says, a Christian theory of knowledge builds on it, or, or it's because of a Christian theory of being that we have a Christian theory of knowledge for what it is. But, 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 but then I ask myself, well, how do I come to know this Christian theory of reality? Well, it's from the Bible. Uh, it's from the absolute authority of, of our religious knowledge of God. Um, and, and then, okay, I'm just leading you diachronically through my line of thinking. <laughs> then I think to myself, well, well, what about that medieval distinction known as, uh, you know, the order of knowing and the order of being? Maybe we qualify it this way. Maybe, maybe we say in the order of being, uh, a Christian theory of reality is primary. And, and in the order of knowing, a Christian theory of knowledge is primary. And I, I looked up this distinction, which comes from the medieval era, and I just want to read to you the definition that C. Stephen Evans gives in the Pocket Dictionary of Apologetics and Philosophy of Religion, because mm. I think you'll get a kick out of this. This is under the entry of Order of Being, Order of Knowing. Um, medieval dis it's a medieval distinction between the ontological order and the epistemological order. For example, and here's what you're going to get a kick out of. Thomas Aquinas believed that God is the ground of existence for all other beings. Hence, in the order of being, ontology, God is primary. However, humans come to know finite objects through their senses first and must infer the existence of God from God's effects. Thus, in the order of knowing, epistemology, finite objects precede God. All right, reading this entry by C. Stephen Evans made me abandon the medieval distinction of the order of being and order of knowing when thinking about Van Til's conception of a theory of being and a theory of knowledge. Um, and I've got further thoughts on that, but, but let me pause my talking and, and ask you, Lane, thoughts on the priority of order of knowledge, order, I mean, uh, of theory of being, theory of knowledge, especially in light of what I just read from C. Stephen Evans. Yeah, C. Stephen Evans' uh, statement, I think, exposes or expounds the essence of Thomas's doctrine of the natural knowledge of God. Uh, knowledge of objects is first. Um, knowledge of God is not naturally implanted, naturally given, concreated. It's not an intrinsic and inalienable feature of the image endowment. Rather, the knowledge of God follows knowledge of sensible objects as the inner light of reason traces back from those objects to a supernatural first cause. And then knowledge of God is attained. I think what Van Til's after, and I won't say everything because there's so much that could be said here. I want us to, to, to talk it through together. But uh, when Van Til is talking about the what we know and the how that we know, I think he self-consciously here uh, indirectly and elsewhere very directly following Calvin, Turretin, and the Reformed confessional tradition. In saying that no sooner was Adam granted existence as the image of God in the work of special creation, then he instantly knew God. God revealed himself to Adam in the book of conscience, internal general revelation. God revealed himself to Adam in the book of nature, external general revelation. And in the language of Calvin, it's not possible neatly to separate or say which comes first, knowledge of God or knowledge of self, because the two, in Warfield's language, are given in the same act of knowledge. That's the sum and substance of this census divinitatis. And to back it up to the question about worship, uh, contrary to Thomas, Adam was not created, according to Thomas, 
as an inherently worshiping creature in natural religious fellowship with God. But for Calvin, Van Til, Voss, others, he was. And so I, I think we can say when it comes to this order of being and order of knowing, uh, given the way that Adam is saturated by, enveloped by an atmosphere of revelation, internal and external, uh, w- we can say there should never be some kind of arbitrary, artificial segregation that prioritizes God in ontology and then prioritizes creaturely objects in terms of epistemology and makes God a conclusion of an inferential process. Rather, there should be a kind of uh, equal ultimacy or mutually conditioning way that we understand the ontological and the epistemological. And that's where I think Van Til's driving, uh, where he's where he's heading. Yeah, on page 49, maybe it would help if I just read how Van Til acknowledges the epistemological dimensions of everything that he said about the nature of reality. He says, we have felt ourselves, he's quoting from his um, Christian apologetics, we have felt ourselves compelled to take our notions with respect to the nature of reality from the Bible. It will readily be conceded that such a notion of reality as we have presented could be received upon authority only. Such a notion of being as we have presented is to be found nowhere except in the Bible. The Bible is taken so seriously that we have not even left any area of known reality by which the revelation that comes to us in the Bible may be compared or to which it may be referred as to a standard. We have taken the final standard of truth to be the Bible itself. So so beyond this point, what's fascinating is Van Til acknowledges that he takes the Bible as his absolute standard because of the theory of being that the Bible itself presents. And so in the act of bowing in submission to the scriptures, he's, he's immediately presupposing the theory of reality, the creator-creature distinction, the the self-contained character of God, the genuineness and infallibility of God's revelation, both in nature and in scripture. And so you can't have one without the other, Van Til is saying. Uh, No sooner do you think as a Christian about how, how do I know God? How do I know anything in relation to God? It's by bowing to the scriptures. And, And what is it that the scriptures teach it is that this is the way I come to know and do know the God who is, uh, assuming all that the scripture reveals about the God who is. So I'm telling you guys, I've wrestled with this, like which comes first? And I think the answer is neither comes first. <laughs> sure. um, we, we, we come to know, uh, we may experientially recognize these things over time. Right. But but the reality of God, he's always there, uh, to use Schaefer's line. And, and, and he has spoken in such a way that both his being and his revelation are inseparably coming to us as his religious creatures. It, and, and that just goes back to the basic point, Lane, that you were speaking of, but also mentioned in many other episodes and discussions that we've had. Just a a distinction and a, and a point that Calvin makes, and any Reformed person shouldn't be afraid of this, but we have this same in religionis, or this sensus divinitatis within us, as created. So Carlton, I, I had the same thought this morning as I was revisiting these things, the same wrestling in my mind that you were experiencing. And it does come back to which is first. Well, it depends on what you mean by first. And so I, I agree with you. There There is a way in which experientially we come maybe to understand and conceptualize how we come to know things through the word and reflection upon the word and the way the world is. Like there's definitely a growth and an understanding in which we come to know more fully or more systematically or more consciously, however we want to categorize those things. Right. But there is always and everywhere uh, an immediate knowledge. We all live before the face of God. We, we, there's no way to be a human being and not know God, even principally. I'm not saying, you know, this is just a chronological thing, but just even logically, there's no way to live and exist as the image of God, which every single human being lives and exists as. There's no, there's no logical way 
to say that there's um, that that knowledge has to come after you know the 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 activity of the inner light of reason you know uh, contemplating sensible you know sensible objects but at the same time we're we are human beings that do know and experience the world through senses too so that's that that throws on its head the definition that you presented of the order of knowing and the order of being but i think at least Acknowledging a distinction between the two can be useful, provided we have these reformed foundations and biblical, yes. you know, understandings of the nature of the image of God and how we relate to God in the first place. Okay, Camden, you're bringing up a very helpful point. P- part of the challenge here, and I'm going to say it in a clumsy way, and I need you guys to clean this up. Okay, when we're talking about Christian experience and how we come to acknowledge the God who is and who has spoken. The way the Bible interprets that for us is that even when we were not Christians, you know, before we're united to Christ, we're still religious beings who in our heart of hearts know God and encounter God. And, and this, this complicates our understanding of, 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 of experience because even before we self-consciously acknowledge ourselves to be rel- religious creatures, we still are religious creatures who know God. And so how do we how do we how do we ex- sort of existentially self-consciously enter sure. in and say yes to this equal ultimacy of of reality and knowledge of god well the bible says it's by a sovereign supernatural act of regeneration it's not by some kind of incremental movement necessarily from from a blank slate into knowledge of god <laughs> It's, uh, it, it, it's from uh, being a religious creature who knows God, but is suppressing that in unrighteousness to actually acknowledging that the air we, we breathe belongs to our Father in heaven. Um, so it's a result of supernatural regeneration, whereby we acknowledge suddenly that we have already been depending on God, but have not confessed him as true. And, and then the only other thing that I would add to this is that if we think in any other way um, and we try to examine, okay, how do, we, how do we come to know anything at all? And we're not presupposing God, not acknowledging that he's always been there, not acknowledging that we're always depending on him in every act of knowing whatsoever, then, then we're already living in rebellion against him. We're, we're assuming a, a futile and cursed method of reasoning that is God defying when we presuppose our own would be neutrality or autonomy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Lane, cl- clean that up a little bit as we think about, as we think about our religious identity as creatures who know God by virtue of our identity as image of God. And then, and then what happens when we come to acknowledge him for who he is. Carlton, I can't uh, clean anything up that you said. It was uh, delightful and lucid. I can uh, illustrate it by way of where Van Til goes in this section and where he goes off and take it back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was created in a natural religious relation to God that existed under covenant. That natural religious relation inherent to the image endowment never existed for a moment in time apart from the inseparable condescension of God spelling out the terms of the covenant by which he was to live and think and move and have his being. So the wholeness of Adam pre-fall was that he was entirely inclined toward God by nature and expressed worship in terms of his covenant. Those were integrated. The fall is the attempt of Adam functionally to separate his nature from the covenantal demands of God, to reason in a way that throws off that positive verbal revelation, and to live as though reason is an independent, self-authenticating authority. That is the delusion of sin. That's the, the, the reality of sin. When you're regenerated, when the Spirit works through the Word to open your blind eyes, what happens? You are now, if I can put it this way, reintegrated 
in the wholeness of being an image bearer who loves God and submits to his special revelation now after the fall in the inscripturated form, uh, the word of God, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, and you confess this to be true and come to know it instantaneously, and then it incrementally deepens and is enriched over time. And so going back, this is the key, I think, always going back to what is normal and natural before the fall um, and the way that redemption restores and then moves toward consummation of that reality, that always, I think, gives us exceptional clarity that is missing in um, views that hold to different ideas of nature, grace, and sin, Roman Catholicism, Arminianism, Pelagianism, etc. Sure. I think it's also yeah. worth mentioning a distinction Vantil makes in several places. I, I don't know exactly when he will get to it, but um, it's the distinction between the psychological and the epistemological. And this causes trouble for some people who don't understand that distinction, and then they see Van Til in some places saying that all men, whether believers or unbelievers, all people know God, but suppress, you know, the unbelievers suppress the truth and unrighteousness. But then in other places, he'll say the unbeliever doesn't know anything, can't know anything. Well, he's making a distinction between what is actually the case and what is the case in someone's soul and the way that reality actually is, that we all are made in the image of God and dependent upon God to operate within the world and to know anything. We're not deists. We're not pantheists. We're not atheists. That's the world. That's reality. That's the ontology here. But then there's also the epistemological aspect, and there are many people who present alternative epistemologies, non-God-centered, non-theistic non-covenantal epistemologies. And for those types of people, that's where Van Til is criticizing. You can't know anything. If the world was the way you say it is, if the world operated the way that you present it to operate, you know, man-centered, you know, God, a triune God, not at the center of it, we don't have an infallible word, all this stuff, then you're right. You could know nothing. You know, there, there's, there's no adequate foundation to describe the world as it as it actually is. So in that sense, you know, we can have both. You can have this distinction between the psychological and the epistemological, but it's really, from one perspective, just the difference between the way things actually are and the way God says they are versus the way sinners portray them. Yeah, exactly, Camden. He's he's making that distinction between who we are as religious beings, irrespective of we what, what we ourselves profess to be the case, whether as Christians or non-Christians, he's saying all men know God, Romans 1, 18 and following. And then he's introducing the impact of sin upon what we confess to be the case and the principles of would-be autonomy that lead to futility regarding mm -hmm. knowledge. Um, well, this this is a good segue because, because he says on page 49, after describing the theory of reality, creator-creature distinction, and the, and the theory of knowledge that goes along with it. He says, it is needless to say that this procedure will appear suicidal to most men who study right. philosophy. Right. I love that he's not afraid to say that. And, you know, so yeah. many people want to have a seat at the table in the philosophical yeah. circles. Van Til's like, no, I, I realize that this, no one's going to like this. Yeah, he's saying <laughs> up front, he, next line, is it not by the help of man's own reason that we're to think out the nature of reality and knowledge? Like, isn't every single human being in the philosophical world going to come to you and say, you idiot, you are checking your brain at the door before using your brain to investigate whether this is worthy of your commitment. You are a fool. And if Van Til has such clarity regarding the fundamental posture of non-Christian thinking when it comes to submission epistemologically to any authority whatsoever. And that posture is, I need to check it out for myself. It, it, needs, to, it needs to satisfy my own criterion for adequacy before I will commit myself to it. And Van Til is saying, listen, if that's your posture with respect to God, you haven't really reckoned with who God is. So, okay, let's, let's talk about this what he says is a modern way of stating this objection in, uh, in Dr. Edgar A. Singer's 
notes on experience and reflection. This comes on page 50. I did a little looking into Dr. Singer. He, he uh, taught at Harvard under William James for a time, but he's carrying on the legacy of pragmatism by uh, C.S. Pierce at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, Van Til says, Dr. Singer tells us that it is the business of philosophy to ask, how do we know? Um, in other words, according to Singer, the epistemological question can and must be asked without saying anything with respect to the ontological question. D don't give me your metaphysical commitments at the outset of your discussion of knowledge. Don't talk to me about the creator-creature distinction and the implications for knowledge. Simply ask the question, how do we know anything at all without regard to the nature of ultimate reality? And Van Til has strong words for this approach. Uh, Lane, what, what, what are the implications Van Til wants to draw out from this modern approach to knowledge apart from a commitment to a particular metaphysic, namely a Christian one? Yeah, I, I think th this is an overflow of Van Til's study in philosophy where he compares in his doctoral dissertation uh, absolute idealism and, and pragmatism. His, his basic point, if we can link this back to the way we opened, his basic point is this is the absolute antithesis to beginning in worship of the creator from the very outset of your existence. And he traces this back to the claims that God made over Eve, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, and once again turns the question to whether or not Eve and by extension, Adam, he uses Eve because she was tempted directly by Satan, whether or not in making any knowledge claim, she could do so independently of the being, revelation, and claims of the triune creator. And so once again, Van Til, in responding, takes us back to the prelapsarian situation and asks the question, what is an image bearer in covenant with God to do when a knowledge claim or a, a counterclaim to what God has said is brought before her? And so he's, he's in answering this, this claim, he's taking us out of the abstract realm of philosophy, where you sit around and say, what psychological mechanisms are invoked to knowing anything? Some kind of abstract, secular, pragmatic conception of epistemology that will quickly reduce to psychology. And he's saying, instead, let's go back and examine the way Eve responded to the claims of Satan and Ask the question, when she made judgments about knowledge, did she also at the same time make judgments about ultimate reality and being? And Van Til's answer is yes, because the two in a Christian approach are involved at every point. Now, I didn't answer everything. I just want to give that as an opening for us to kind of pursue further so no, I, I love it i think your your counsel of going back to the pre-fall order to clarify these epistemological questions is very helpful and and when you think about satan's enticement of eve it's just so clear as he puts it on page uh 51 satan said in effect that eve should pay no attention to this problem of being he told her she should just the question, how do we know, without asking the question, what do we know? In other words, just, just so we're not missing the point here, Van Til's drawing a line between Dr. Edgar Arthur Singer's philosophical approach to knowledge and Satan's enticement of Eve, right. telling Eve, think about this tree without regard to the existence of God. You decide how you're going to address this question of whether to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and here's the 
here's the chairperson's uh, chair in the conference room. I'll pull up a seat on your left. God will pull up a seat on your right. And you will assess for yourself uh, which one should be heeded. And, and he's saying already uh, she's living in epistemological rebellion against God. And the point you just made, Lane, was already at a deeper level, Eve has already assumed an anti-God position with regard to the nature of reality. Yes. That, that, the, that fallen man cannot help but presuppose some notion of ultimate reality when he asks the question, how do we know? To, to think that you're not presupposing something about God when you're reasoning apart from God is a fool's errand. And what Eve is presupposing about God when she's entertaining the opinions as competing equally ultimate claims between God and Satan is that God is operating on the same level as the creature. She is effectively denying the creator creature distinction. Now we're getting into deeper territory with respect to the way a Christian theory of knowledge relates to a Christian theory of being. Yeah. Uh, Lane. Eve, Eve pre-enacts Singer, Singer reenacts Eve. Uh, is Van Very good. Point. Very yeah. good. Well, we can keep going on this point <laughs> and talk about how the being of God bears on our theory of knowledge how the creator creature distinction in particular relates to our theory of knowledge. Do you guys want to move on to that section? Yeah. As God, as she, as he moves into God's knowledge of himself on page 52. Sure. Yeah. I, and I think the, 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 the quick transition to it is, you know, he's explicit there on uh, page 51 that God claimed he was the creator, that his being was ultimate while Satan's being was created and therefore dependent on God. So when Eve made herself the arbiter of the hypothesis, quote unquote, that God gave, the hypothesis that Satan gave, not only was she assuming the prerogative to investigate for herself, but she was already assuming that God was not the sovereign creator who was ultimate and determinative. Uh, in matters of truth. And and so that leads Van Til organically to this discussion, as you're turning us, Carlton, to the question of God's knowledge of himself and God's knowledge of the world, which is really critical for this. Yes, yes. Okay, I, I was pushing us to move on. Let me read one more thing. He says, he concludes here, it would appear then that the theory, that the theory of being that we have presented fits in with the notion of the Bible as the authoritative revelation of God. We come to the Bible, we accept it as the authoritative revelation of God because of the conception of God that the Bible itself presents. You know, when I got that kind of locked into my brain, it was just epistemologically transformative for me. Yeah. We come to the Bible as the very word of God because of the, of the revelation of God that it presents. We don't go outside the Bible to, to establish the grounds upon which we will then accept the Bible. But the Bible, as the very word of God, becomes the light in which we see light, right? Amen. And, and any time we're not, here's the, here's the apologetic twist. Anytime we're not doing that, we're, we're, we're walking down a road of eroding all knowledge whatsoever. We're walking down a road of futility and of would-be autonomy and we're imagining that we can think about our knowing apart from the existence and revelation of God. And it is, it is destructive to the Christian faith, even when we bring that mentality to the things of God. In fact, we might say it's especially spiritually dangerous to bring that mentality to the things of God, because you're verbally assenting to things that all the while you're actually building upon your own sense of of prideful capacity to acquire knowledge apart from the God who made you. And you're already presupposing a ton about, about God, limiting him, diminishing him, functionally treating him as though he's an enlarged creature. Okay. Well, well that then sets up, I think maybe why Van Til moves on page 52 to God's knowledge of himself. 
because so far we've been talking about pre-fall order, uh, the Adamic covenantal requirements on man, but behind all of that is God's knowledge of himself. This is where we must begin to have a truly Christian conception of knowledge. We have to return to who God is, and particularly Van Til wants to make a big point about God's knowledge and being, his knowledge particularly of himself and his being, being coterminous. Okay, I think for the reader, I mean, the listener, it might be helpful if we just tease out what, what does Van Til mean by saying that God's self-knowledge and his being are coterminous? And why is that so significant for Van Til? Uh, the, the concept of coterminity uh, for Van Til means simply or I shouldn't use simply because that's what I was going to say. The concept of coterminity means that God is simple. He's not capable of being divided into parts. And Van Til's wanting to say that God's being is absolute and immutable. God's knowledge is absolute and immutable. And he, he uses that language there of saying that um, the nature of God's being, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, requires the complete exhaustive self-consciousness of God, um, so that being and knowledge are coterminous. Now, what does that mean? I'll give you the brass tacks quote from page 53. He says, we should have to introduce um, the succession of moments into the being of God for the same reason that we have introduced it into the consciousness of God. Now, I took, I didn't read a larger quote, but here's the point that Van Til's trying to make. If there are no succession of moments in the divine being, there is no succession of moments in divine knowledge, because God's being and knowledge are coterminous. God is simple. And so um, Van Til's point here is that God knows in a manner consistent with God's being, mm -hmm. and that method or mode of knowledge is not incremental, it's not developmental, and it's not inferential at any point, whether you're talking, and we'll get into these details, whether you're talking about the necessary knowledge of God or the free knowledge of God, Van Til's wanting to say, God, as goes God's knowledge, so goes God's being and vice versa. Yeah, yeah. Maybe one quote just to precede that, sure. that polemical point he was making in the quote that you made about introducing succession, which is devastating for our doctrine of God. He says on page 52, there are those who say that God's being is absolute, but God's consciousness is subject to sub succession mm -hmm. of moments. Watson. So, so there are those who want to say, listen, God exists. He is God himself. He perhaps is God of himself, but, but then somehow when it comes to his relation to the world, uh, God's knowledge develops. And Van Til is saying in the quote that you gave, Lane, no, 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 no. If you, because of the simplicity of God, if you introduce succession into the knowledge of God, you've introduced development into the being of God. And, and if we follow that line, we're on the road to pantheism, brothers. So Van Til spends uh, quite a bit of time, and Camden, you're right, he mentions this Arminian theologian, Richard Watson, and his contention that God's knowledge, at least in terms of his knowledge of the world, somehow depends upon the events of the world. And we know ultimately he's going to say it depends upon the will of man uh, to decide for or against God. But, he, but he, he quotes this guy, Richard Watson, um, in his discussion of duration. And I actually, I looked up this uh, 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 theological institutes and what, what Watson is doing here in this quote, and it's pretty self-evident from the quote itself, is that he's, 
he's conceptualizing uh, a temporal understanding of duration, um, which I realize sounds like a tautology. Uh, and he's saying, listen, du duration as we understand it must apply to God or else the eternity of God is nonsensical to us. He's saying God's eternity is just an elongated extension of what we experience in time. And Van Til is saying, no, when we take a created category like time and we simply try to expand it and say that's what divine eternity is, then we've already defined God in terms of the creature and we've missed what divine eternity really is. Our conception, temporally bound though it is, uh, as it is of time, cannot be the standard of, for who God is, because we are the creature, he is the creator. And so he's using Watson as an, as an example of creaturely thinking being imposed upon God, um, rather than taking as primitive uh, God's self-determined uh, being and self-determined knowledge. Okay, uh, I have a question for you guys. When Van Til begins to talk about succession in the thinking of God, in the mind of God, in the knowledge of God, and he says that this would make God dependent on something outside of himself and therefore introduce development of the being of God and therefore lead us on the road to pantheism. And I want to know the answer to this because I'm not quite sure about it. When, when Van Til uses the term pantheism, you know, we, we often think of that as saying everything is God mm -hmm. and God is everything. Mm -hmm. Does Van Til use the term pantheism in a wider sense to include that, but also to include any notion in which God and the created temporal world exist on a single plane yeah. of reality? Any, any blurring of the creator-creature distinction, even if you try at least rhetorically to maintain an eternal pole and a temporal pole, any third notion of commonality uh, between the creator and the creature, does he use the term pantheism to speak of that in addition to just rank God is all and all is God? I, th I think so. I think my, my sense of his use there, um, and I haven't come across a specific definition, if I ever do, I'd like to pull that out from his letters or whatnot, but my sense is that he's using it in a broader uh, semantic domain, a broader sense to describe any notion of ontological overlap. So uh, just to use the language you just used, any any compromising of the creator-creature distinction. But I also think at work here is a tendency that Van Til often has to play out the implications of a view. So it's not as if the people he has in mind that he would categorize as pantheists are self-avowedly pantheistic or would necessarily oh, yeah. see themselves as fully developed pantheists the way we might in, in an Eastern philosophy, for example. But what Van Til, I think, is saying, at least implicitly, this is my sense. I'd be happy to be shown otherwise. But my sense is that He's saying, look, if you if you acknowledge that God and man are on any level playing field at any point, if there's any overlap in the two circles that he often draws, then you you've lost the whole thing. It's it's functionally uh, ontologically equivalent to just saying they're completely identical at all anyway. That's my initial sense. And I think he's he's accurate in that, but um I don't know, Lane, do you have any thoughts on his semantic use of the word pantheism? You've dealt with that quite a bit in, in the new book here. Well, I didn't want to, I wasn't going to mention the book, but uh, if you bring it up. Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do note that um, in that Gerhardus Voss, in his Reform Dogmatics, Volume 1, uh, speaks of pantheism as any view that ascribes mutual change and development over time to God and man in relation. Uh, and Van Til, on page 200 of his Introduction to Systematic Theology, speaks of views, and these are very close to, they, they have moved into ostensibly reformed camps, uh, uh, through uh, the teaching of of uh, of a few theologians uh, in in our midst, 
Van Til says this. He says, to speak of the limitation of God is to deny his absoluteness and therewith to deny God himself. If we were to speak of God's limitation, we should have to speak of self-limitation. And we should have to begin with his self-limitation at the creation of the world. At least two second-generation Vantillians depart from Vantill and affirm God's voluntary self-limitation at the creation of the world. Uh, a second mode of existence, properties characterized by mutability and change. And he says the result would be a hiding of God instead of a revealing of God. Pantheism has constantly sought to wedge itself into the church by this avenue. And so here, page 200 of the IST, he explicitly defines as a pantheism, not the crass identification of God and the creature, but the voluntary or uh, the voluntary limitation of God in creation by which he comes to be characterized by the dynamics of of change and development mm -hmm. by extension ignorance that characterizes the creature so i think um his his language there won't just apply to philosophical views sure uh, but to the theological views some very current so for for the visual learners that would be an example of the upper larger circle that van Til draws expanding or descending to overlap with the smaller dependent circle. So we would have an overlap of uh, the being of God and creature. Let me ask another question on this same point, uh, just to tease this out for listeners. What, what are the consequences? What are we actually saying if we were to say that God has self-knowledge, he's independent, but then also as he comes into relation with creation, then there, there's this additional succession of moments. Could we say, I'm playing advocate of some kind. I won't say devil's advocate. Maybe I should. It's just It's devil's advocate here. Um, what are the consequences theologically of that? Splitting God's knowledge or saying he has some additional thing that now he's adopted or assumed? Oh, man. There's a, la there's a laundry list. <laughs> um, let, What's a thumbnail just... sketch for, the, for, yeah. for today? We can get into this, I'm sure, in further chapters, but I think the first thing I would say is that we have we have impugned the absoluteness of God. We have denied that he is the self-determined, uh, self-knowing, sovereign ruler of creation. Flowing from that, we have ascribed to creation some kind of non-created, autonomous existence that stands over against God that he must investigate in order to come to know. And, and then with that, we have therefore ascribed to man some notion in which he can use his mind uh, that, that is outside the purview of God's lordship. So we have impugned the religious character of man as the image of God. And then the fourth thing I would say is that, that having, having, having assaulted the absoluteness of God and, and denied the intrinsically and exhaustively personal character of his creation under his sovereign rule and diminished the religious character of man and ascribed some notion of autonomy to him, apologetically, Van Til would say, we, we have in principle destroyed the ability of man to say anything coherent and intelligible about God himself and the world. Because in order to do that, man depends upon the God who is exhaustively self-known and whose creation is an exhaustive or is a thoroughgoing revelation of who he is as the right. absolute triune God. So, so Van Til says on page 53, um, after talking about the, the self-determinative character of God's knowledge of himself, and by the way, he, he, he sets that over against Spinoza, who sees divine knowledge as bound up with, with the existence of the world, um, as does, by the way, Bavink in volume two. Van Til's just following Bavink here. But at the bottom of page 53, he says, as we shall see later, 
it is upon the identity of knowledge and being in God that we pin our hopes and convictions that human predication is possible. The transcendental approach of Van Til's apologetic, the, the, the devastating critique of, of unbelief burst through in little places. And this is one of those places or before he really gets to it later in the book that, that all of human predication, all intelligible knowledge and activity and existence of, of man depends upon a reformed conception of the triune God. So yeah, assault on God, salt on man, carving out autonomy and ultimately right. principally destructive of human knowledge and predication is all flow from uh, introducing development into the being of God. Yeah. I think that's right, right on the money. If I was talking to my kids who are 10 and eight and five at the dinner table, let me give the kid version. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here's the children's children's lesson part of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, if God is changing, then he's not absolute. He's not God. Uh, if God develops in his knowledge and knowledge is identical with the being of God, then what, what just happened? How could, how could he come to know things he didn't already know? If that's true, to use your language, it's an assault on the absoluteness of God. Then, he's, then he wasn't absolute. Uh, vice versa, if we're saying, well, this isn't, his knowledge is not identical to his being, then we're saying God is no longer simple. He's made up of parts or he has his knowledge is some other thing. Then the question becomes, well, what is this development of knowledge? It's a second nature. I mean, is God assuming a second nature in his relation to creation? I mean, this is where people start to go with the incarnational model, which is totally destructive for a theology proper. Um, because when we say Christ is developing in his knowledge, that's his human knowledge <laughs> according to his human nature. This is just basic Chalcedon codified in 451, right? Like, we don't need to redo that. Uh, so this, the real basic thing is if God is developing in his knowledge, then he's not the absolute all-powerful God that we confess. And yeah, he wasn't yeah. then, and maybe he isn't now. God can't change from what he is. Otherwise, by definition, he's no longer the God that's presented in Scripture. Yeah, you've got a very theological dinner table. <laughs> um, I think one, one way to put it is, if God does, it, how about framing it like, what if God doesn't know what's going to happen next? Exa- yeah, exactly. Because that's, that's what we're saying, right? right? I mean, we're saying if his knowledge develops, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He learns things. Right. Well, what are the implications if God doesn't know what's going to happen next, what are the implications for his promises? What are his implications regarding his plan? Right. Suddenly these things are thrown into uncertainty. And I think the smallest child gets that will be able to get that. And that's why people would say, well, surely uh, God does know all things that will come to pass. But if they want to entertain these ideas, these pantheistic ideas, that's where they start to go down into dividing God's knowledge or to, right. to and, and, and they might not say it's a second nature, a two nature theology proper, but in effect, that's exactly what it is. God is assuming covenantal characteristics or properties or attributes that aren't essential. They're not who he is absolutely, but they're, they're some other category. Then the question is, well, what is that? And how do those two relate anyway? It doesn't solve any problem in the end of the day because you still have the, you know, if there's a problem trying to figure out how God relates to the world and you posit a third man, there's still the problem of how the third man relates to the absolute God in the first place. You, there's a mystery there. So maybe we're getting far afield here, but this is, oh. this is, this is at the center here of talking <laughs> about the nature of being and the nature of knowledge. Yeah, and Van Til it. constantly brings us back to the basic foundational lessons that we get in the ca- in the children's catechism. Wow. Like my my nephew says, you know, uh, God is a spirit and does not have a body like Batman. 
That's just great. This, <laughs> this is true. This is theologically true. No, he also, he also like doesn't have a mind like Batman. So <laughs> doesn't have a mind like the Riddler. Right. But um, <laughs> um, but the um, I, just just to I don't want to go too much further, but I think this is so important. What you brothers bring out is that this is of the utmost religious importance for us. It's not just about having the, the, the right doctrine and the truth, although that is indispensable, but it has a religious implication. I preached a sermon a while back to my congregation in the evening where I said, if God does not have definite and certain knowledge of the future, he can make no definite and certain promises about the future. Amen. Amen. And so it's just that basic that this is introducing a different God who offers no religious certitude and grounds no religious hope. That's why, in addition to all this, that construction must be rejected as idolatry. Right. And if God has knowledge of the future but can actively or freely limit that knowledge, it's the same effect. Yes, it is. Yeah. Covenantally, what he is covenantally makes life a crapshoot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I know we're winding down here, but I don't want to leave the discussion without s citing some scripture texts that people wrestle with, right? Like to go back to our pre, let's get clarity pre fall, okay? Regarding knowledge and the absoluteness of God. When God comes to Adam in the garden and says, Where are you? Okay. I I know some children in our congregation who who understand what's going on there because they have parents who come in and oh my kids know this. And yeah. and think, dad does this yeah. all the time <laughs> but but Lane talk to us about what what is God doing there as let me put it this way what is God doing there with Adam as the self-determined absolute simple God in relation to Adam let me start by just sketching what he's not doing. Okay. He has not limited himself to have a finite, developmental, ignorant mind like the creature so that there's a bona fide game of hide and seek in the garden. He's not coming and saying, boy, where did they go? Adam, where are you? You know, and calling out authentically, really, truly in ignorance. That's not the case at all. Meredith Klein in Kingdom Prologue and a portion of um, Images of the Spirit speaks of this revelation as what he calls the primal parousia, where the all-knowing, all-determining, self-contained, living and active and sovereign triune God is giving Adam a judicial summons to come forward for judgment. And his coal, his voice isn't a voice crying out in ignorance and asking the question, where are you not knowing? It's the voice that bends and breaks the cedars of Lebanon that's laying bare the earth and bringing Adam and Eve forth to face the judgment of God. At least up until that time in the narrative, you're expecting the end of Adam and Eve's existence and their banishment into hell. You don't get the revelation of the gospel until you get to 314. And Herman Bavink uh, I just want people to know, and his RD uh, 192 says that Genesis 3.9 um, is God using anthropomorphic language to summon Adam and Eve. And he says the idea that God did not know where Adam and Eve were, this is Bobbing's language, is quote unquote absurd. It's absurd because God knows the most minor and insignificant details, Matthew 6, 8, 10, 30, the most deeply concealed things in the heart and mind, uh, Psalm 7, 10, Jeremiah 17, 9, and 10, the thoughts and reflections of the mind, Psalm 139, 2, Ezekiel 11, 5, 1 Corinthians 3, 20, human origin, nature, and all human action, the whole of Psalm 139, night and darkness cannot hide, Psalm 139, 11, 12, hell and perdition, he knows, wickedness and sin, the conditional, things of the future. He has, I'm going to guess just off the, uh, looking at this text here uh, from RD to 192, he has around 50 texts <laughs> that teach this, and, and here's the key. 
This is the language that I think we should use to stave off this idea of divine ignorance that's infecting so many quarters of evangelical and even ostensibly reformed uh, quarters. Bavink, Van Til, following the teaching of the scripture, affirmed the unqualified omniscience of the triune creator. Yeah, Yeah. God doesn't even limit himself. He doesn't come to the garden and adopt a new nature according to which he is ignorant. That's yes, the, the, the glorious thing about this is that the unqualified omniscience of God, to borrow from Van Til, I'm kind of using it in my own way, is the Magna Carta of Christian liberty <laughs> when it comes to knowledge yeah. and, and worship. Amen. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, it's the foundation for uh, a wonderfully free, worshipful conception of self in the world. Amen. And it's glorious. It is. So where does that leave us for next time? We get uh, all the way to page 54, unless there's something else that we need to cover that is, is pertinent. Uh, we, we will come to amplify and explain even more of this, I presume, uh, in section two on page 54, God's knowledge of the world. So on point, it should be an easier segue. Carlton, your review duties next time will be lesser. So um, Good. hopefully it won't, we won't, uh, the half-life of our knowledge won't, won't uh, erode it. <laughs> so we'll, hopefully we'll do this episode quick, uh, you know, more, more quickly than we did between April and July. But that'll bring us into uh, further discussion of some more important topics. So we'll be cruising on this idea of the Christian philosophy of knowledge for a while. And uh, it's a good place to be. So get a copy of Van Til's The Defense of the Faith. Uh, You can get electronic copies um, through Logos as well. Lots of different editions out there. If you have any questions about the differences in in editions or questions about finding, locating good old copies just to have a nice hardcover, uh, you can send us a note at mail at reformedforum.org. And uh, we'll set you up. Brian Noah can certainly help you with the book side of things. And of course, uh, as I mentioned to begin, uh, take a look at our website for this new book, uh, The Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til by Lane G. Tipton. It's a long time coming, but we have a whole lot of copies of this. But if you'd like to jump in and get one of the the deluxe packages where you get the book, you get the uh, embossed page, you receive um, electronic copies of the book, challenge coin with van tills you can impress all your friends at the pub and slam this down and if they don't have theirs they owe you a drink and the metallic print so we got the reform forum shopping network (laughs) in full effect here today well done i don't have any boats that i can cut in half (laughs) and tape back up and then get out in the water to to show (laughs) to show how good my product is but if i could visually depict you know what this book will do to your mind for the better uh, than than I would if I could, but uh, yeah, oxy clean your head. Um, It'll tape up your, <laughs> your mind. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> tape up your mind. Uh, anyway, uh, th- it's been really fun. I can't say how much I enjoy uh, spending time with you two, uh, even you know distance wise. But um, I'm so excited about this book and other things we have going on at Reformed Forum, the Fall Conference. Just visit reformedforum.org. You'll find everything you need. Uh, from us there. And if you have any questions or comments, write in, let us know, and we'll hope to get back to you soon. But I want to thank everybody for listening and watching, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.